Good afternoon, it's Joyful Hermit. I'm going to, sh I'm having another slow day. Lots of nausea again. I don't know, I'm going to call the pain doctor and ask if there's anything else. Maybe try Zofran again, which helps cancer patients with nausea. It used to not work at all for me. Maybe my body has changed slightly. We must never give up, <laughs> never keep trying. Then I might might try to go outside and do something if I'm up to it. Um, so I was going to share yesterday, but I'll do it now, a message um, include, that my little son at the time, uh, one night when we were doing night prayers, um, his sisters, I think, had I think the next sister had gone on to college. No, no, they were still at home, but they were older and didn't come in at every night for the stories and stuff. He was in third grade, and he was on my bed, and he was just talking and saying, just, I have a question. He says, do you think God would answer this question? He says, just, just what is it? Why, why are we here? What's What's the meaning? What's, what's, he said, what's the meaning of this, of, of life? And it was such sort of a profound question from someone. He was nine at the time. He was um, held back due to all the divorce upset. Uh, he was very, we had so much uh, upset and moving and different things that in kindergarten, his teacher noticed that he had trouble making any kind of changes, even lining up to go to the rest for their restroom break, and decided that he needed to have another year, so he went to a pre-first class of about, I think, 12 students with a wonderful teacher, and then he entered into regular first grade after that. Um, so he was back a year, which he finally went in college, so appreciated that added year that he had. So he was nine when he asked this question, but was in third grade. And I told him what we needed to do to get an answer. I thought it was a very good question. Why are we here? What is the meaning? What's our purpose? So um, I said, you pray and I'll pray. We'll both pray and ask God to, to give us an answer. And I said, it might come in a dream or you might wake up hearing some, some explanation, or tomorrow or the next day or at some point in time, we will get an answer maybe from something in our everyday life, something maybe your teacher says, or who knows what, or we read about in one of our books or something. But I said, God will answer us. You just have to have faith. So he was very sincere about all this. And uh, we prayed and asked, and he went off to bed. I said, come come first thing in the morning and we'll see if we've had any answers, either of us. Well, in the middle of the night, I was awakened at 3 a.m. It seemed to be a time that I was often awakened. I think that's maybe the first watch or something, or the second watch. Uh, I think the, uh, in Jesus' time, it started at midnight, and then the day every three hours would be the uh, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth watch, or something like that, for 24 hours. So, um, three o'clock in the morning, I was awakened and uh, heard this voice say, to love, to learn to love. That was it. I knew that was the answer, or an answer. I was interested in knowing if my son had any kind of answer, of course hoping he did, actually, because we, we want people to have experiences that help them know how real God is and how to count on God. But we also need to learn through faith of waiting and not necessarily having an outright answer like I was given in the middle of the night. In the morning, he comes running in. Did you get any answer? Did you? I said, yes, I did. Did you have any dreams? Or he couldn't remember his dreams. Who knows? Chances are maybe the Holy Spirit 
had given him something in a dream that he simply forgot. But I didn't forget the answer, and I talked to him about it. To love, to learn to love. So to love, to love, to learn to love. That was how it was. To love, to love, to learn to love. So it's not enough that we just love or say we have unconditional love for our children when I've already, I don't know, I may, I may stop saying unconditional love because um, I don't want to confuse that with any kind of love that we think, well, we'll love, we'll love what this wrongdoing or something. But um, I love all souls, and I love everyone, every human being. I love creatures. I love nature. But I don't love uh, killing or hurting others or lies or deceptions or all these vices, any vices I don't love, including all obviously ones that I have. So um, that's the distinguishing point, but to learn to love. God had said love to learn to love. So that is an, a new, or I don't know if it's new, but a different step in loving. It's to love, learning to love. All our lives to keep this delight and desire, this love of learning to love, alive in us always and active in us. So maybe that's why I keep going on and on about unconditional love or discovering love. Why I, oh, I got so excited when I read Bernard of Clairvaux's book on love, Love of God, and his um, four levels of love with the, the utmost level being to love God in himself. To love God as God and for all of God's attributes as to how God is and what God is and why God is. To love every aspect of God, including God who guides and forms us in ways maybe we don't particularly like. But there again, we can learn to love all that God does for us. And that's a reminder for me today. I, ha I have this one person in my life who uh, went through a divorce. It was a, a marriage that should never have happened. And the person was encouraged and told way back, way back, no, wait, wait, don't do this, don't do this. Even pointed out some of the aspects as to why the the other person was a very controlling person back then very controlling as a young man and also had uh, childhood baggage that was not resolved and that's not the best way to enter into a marriage unless you have some of these things worked out for ourselves and they didn't know each other long and of course, I thought of my own situation. So, um, but they, they finally, after years, uh, divorced. And I just find it a marvel that about four years before the divorce, this person was introduced to a sport looking for something uh, to help uh, a child being homeschooled for PE, but the adult found the sport to be so much fun and had talent in it, started to meet friends, much needed friends, because when you're married sometimes to someone 
who is, say, a um, covert introvert, and the other person is not, and the person who's the covert introvert and more controlling is not interested in, in social life or friends, and friends aren't attracted to that kind of a couple or person. So um, friends came along, Income developed that was needed, and God provided. God provided a career that was joyous and fun and involved all the delightful experiences that this person loved and wanted to have in life. And I had to think of that today. In my situation, it was not at all like that. God provided for me uh, uh, as, uh, out of a situation that was uh, very difficult, cruel, painful relationship, but I wasn't given into, say, a career that I, my, my career was cut off, my physical body was cut off, however, God provided for me in that way so that I could rear the children. The children needed to be reared by a parent that um, God was going to choose for those children. Someone who would nurture them and be with them and who wanted them. All, you know, even from the beginning wanted to have children. So, um, but the situation was, is that it was going to mean a life of suffering. So I thought of that this morning, how um, it's easy for this other person and for me to see with this other person how God provided in such a temporally joyous way and provided an income for the person and friendships and delight in the career that was a delightful career for the person and wonderful exercise, etc., and then provided, say, for someone like me in a way that did not include um, freedom from suffering. Well, and no one has freedom from suffering. I'm not explaining this well. Anyway, just provided for me in a totally different way that God knew was necessary had it not been for how my back was injured and my neck, etc., cetera, um, the person wouldn't have gone on their way. Um, I wouldn't have, if it hadn't been for the death experience and me being sent back, I wouldn't have reared the children. And, and I, if, if it hadn't been a uh, life-altering surgery with the death experience, I wouldn't have been at home with the children. I would have been out working with little children. So my children benefited by having what ended up a stay-at-home mom, often a stay-in-bed mom even. <laughs> so um, God provides for us in the way that God wills. And in that sense, we must learn to love we must learn to love, to learn to love. Learn to love love in whatever way God brings it to us. To love our lives and to learn to love our lives as God has loved us and given to us what he wills for our life. And God being love, God is love only gives us good and he gives us what is loving even though our perceptions might not view it that way i had to ask this morning lord why didn't you allow me to have uh to not to have the the back surgery have not been devastating or a failure and so that I could have had uh, finished, uh, finished up 
what the, the thing that was left was a dissertation to write and gotten into the field or some other field that I loved and would have provided well for the children and they would have seen me in a different light rather than as a uh, exhausted person in pain all the time. And the Lord gave me answers back. You know? <laughs> uh, look at what this would have meant. You wouldn't have been at home for your little children. And back then, you know, it wasn't homeschooling. And my children um, thrived in school. And that's where they made their friendships and their and in church and all and and they um, that was the time period too that there wasn't so much homeschooling and could I have even kept up with the homeschooling to the degree that this other person has been able to do as an active person no I couldn't have I don't know what we would have done on the three to five to eight days that I was laid up in bed some it would be in cycle sometimes as soon as every three weeks I would have a pain siege and um, it was enough that they had to get themselves up get their breakfast get off to school dress do all that uh, God did let let the surgery go for three years the last year I was very ill with pain but in those three years or two and a half years I was able to do more for the children then, and I could drive a little, and etc., but not much. <laughs> but it, it was different, but they don't remember even me then. They don't remember the energy that it took even to suffer or to uh, take care of three children by myself and to get us moved, and not just once, but we moved, I think, three times due to, I've mentioned before, the problems that would occur. But um, to love, to learn to love, and to know that we are learning to love, it's not necessarily, I don't think, at any given point in our life, in our temporal life, that we can say, I have learned love, and I don't have anything more to learn about love. No. God, in that answer he gave, and I'm sure he was so pleased that this little boy, so sincere and so loving of God, back then, asked that question and wanted God to answer it, and God did. Probably had God told my son that, my little boy that answer, he might not have remembered it, it might not have made enough cognitive sense to him at that time but he told the little boy's mother and I could explain it to him and it was earth-shattering wonderful to me also to realize love to learn love to learn to love um, and so I'm going to pray right now just in this little sharing that God teaches us more about love and more how to love. And just as I learned in the last couple of days through um, using Thomas Merton as an example, which I regret using him as an example of his life and what, what transpired. I should have just used my own life and how I've had to, uh, I've sinned and still will and still, I'm sure, today probably something or a thought that will flash in that doesn't belong in there or something. Um, but to continue learning to love and, and learning that it's okay and it's proper not to love vices and, ver and vices or sin, or wrong thoughts, or wrong actions, or wrong words, to not love that. But what goes with love is forgiveness. So I forgive myself for using a person who's deceased, using his 
public life is an example. Not everyone probably knew all that about Thomas Merton and his background, and psychologists have since um, analyzed why he fell into this again at a later age, the, one, the, the sensual love and all that. Um, he hadn't resolved that as a young man. And, um, and maybe, who knows, maybe he had a little bit of, of, of narcissism, or a lot maybe, developed from his fame and his beautiful writing that he did. It, it, it's a cross to bear when you have that kind of talent, and it takes off with that kind of fame that he had. So um, there's reasons why we sin. That's something to learn that helps us to learn to love, is there's always a reason why. And it could be even that, that the devil made us do it. <laughs> That, that we, in our weakness, in our humanness, are not even learning about the devil and how the different tricks of the devil is important to learn, but how we can be duped. And then we go off and do something that when we come to our awareness of, oh my goodness, how on earth would I have ever done that? Then we confess our sins Lord, forgive me for this or that, and why? And, and feel the sorrow, and want to change, and make a plan to change. That's all part of learning to love also, to learning to love God, and to want to please God, and to learning to love, learn to love other people in a way that we would rather be plucked off this earth than to hurt someone. Um, that's getting more to the depth of love and to be willing to sacrifice our, our lives. So I realized that this morning that God was showing me also just how much I loved my children, that I agreed in the death experience to come back to rear my children was one thing he said and the other one was to fulfill my mission which I'm not sure if I'm doing that now or not but um, and then to sacrifice for my children and to get through pain sieges for them without medication I would remind myself to try to get through and of course, so many times I wanted to have my life ended. But I would remind myself, no, God sent you back to rear your children. You have to cope. You have to get through this. You have to get through this next surgery or this other situation or get them moved into a lesser home then to help start paying for college when that time came and to... Um, do what, you know, get, get it together, get the energy going to um, sew the formals or to um, sew the magic cape so that the little, the little boy got into magic like magic tricks and make the Halloween costumes and all that. Make those gingerbread houses so their friends could come over and, you know, get the energy to get all this candy accumulated. They could make gingerbread houses with their friends and, and create memories, create new memories instead of what we had been through with the divorce and to get their minds off of some of the very bad things that happened. And it worked. They don't remember. So a love can be in those tangible ways. Love can be now in how much I love my children and I praise God that he's answered my prayers, that they're healthy, that they have not known the suffering that I've known. They've known suffering. They knew it as children a lot, and they, but I tried to spare them and shield them from a lot of it. And it evidently worked because they do not remember even why we moved, why the judge let us move even. They don't remember 
what was the big impetus behind the urgency then to get moved. Um, and that's wonderful because, and I am uh, love that they have wonderful careers, that they, each of them love their careers. They love them, even though they're very demanding careers. They love their families, they love their children, and, and they love life. And that's part of our learning to love. Learning to love, to learn to love, is to be able to love for the love of others and for the love of the world and for the goodness that is out there for people. And especially, though, to learn to love God more and more in whatever things he brings to our lives like my knee surgery when I realized it had failed I knew that God had that because I had all these plans of doing things more and, and still setting aside my mission which I'm thinking is to share my spiritual experiences with you or with whomever wants to hear them and my thoughts on God. I think that's the mission because he gave me so many spiritual experiences that um, that's the only thing I can figure. If you all have any answer from God on what is Joyful Hermit's mission, please let me know. Because I had to face it. My children are reared. That's over. And they have made it clear they don't want the involvement. They have estranged for the most part. Not totally, but for the most part. They're outliving their lives. And um, and I have God gave me this essentially dead aspect for viewing the world as someone who's already on the other side and sees the needs to pray about them or to leave messages like through this screen. And um, so that's that was very loving, even though we might perceive as being dead or essentially dead as, ooh, that sounds awful. No, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's an answer to prayer. It's a means of observing and of helping others and of starting to notice things around that require or would benefit by prayer and by love. So let us love to learn to love. And furthermore, love to love to, how did that go? <laughs> anyway, you get the idea. Love to love to learn to love, even. God bless his real presence in us. And maybe you have a blessed day, all of us. And um, let us love to learn to love.